have Sherry Choir, who is here from the Indie Donor Network. Uh, she's going to talk about how we can prolong and give uh, more options for our donations by using ECMO. So I'd like to invite Sherry Choir up. So my name is Sherry Choir. I'm actually the Director of Organ Services at Indiana Donor Network, and Jeff Hare is with me as well. He's the Manager over In-House Recovery and Perfusion uh, at Indiana Donor Network. So we're going to start off with a little bit of history about donation, how donation has started, um, and where we are in expanding those gifts, um, and talk a little bit about ECMO as well as how it's used differently in some of our uh, recoveries with donors. So really just starting um, in the beginning, uh, kidney was really the first human organ to be successfully transplanted. Heart, liver, and pancreas then were successfully por performed in the night, late 1960s. And then through the mid-70s, um, individual hospitals became actual transplant hospitals. Um, here in Indianapolis and in the state of Indiana, we have uh, IU Health, Ascension St. Vincent, and Lutheran Hospital are all of our transplant centers here in the, in the state of Indiana. Uh, as pressure really grew for more transplants, they started uh, having nurses do uh, on-the-job training, um, and that's how we really started more with um, that uh, process and being able to um, allocate organs and, and bring them in as um, adjuncts to those transplant hospitals. So more and more responsibility really led to uh, development of hospital-based organ procurement organizations. So there was actually a part in that hospital that um, now has become independent. So it was staffed by the hospital. So as you see in some of the shows, which is never really that accurate of Chicago Med and places like that where they have somebody come into the ER and they say, well, we think we have somebody on the third floor that needs a heart transplant. That's not how it works. Um, and we just lost that. So it's always interesting um, when you see those things because coming from an organ procurement organization, you realize everything that goes into that to be able to actually allocate and how um, that accuracy of somebody being on the third floor in the ICU is going to get that hard is, is not something that is um, uh, something that it's very regulated by the government and those lists are ran uh, that are um, really the sicker people at the top and you know that type of thing so that isn't that isn't accurate when you see those types of things in those shows so I'll keep going on from memory just a little bit so the reason why we started with uh, kidney transplants uh, first is because of you know what we're paying out you know Medicare Medicaid on the billions of dollars that are actually uh, towards end-stage end renal disease and looking at those of, you know, Part D, uh, what's um, being paid by the hospital for the different, um, you know, staffing as well as different dialysis clinics and things like that. And then when you go and look at the, the billions of dollars that are um, put for end-stage renal disease for dialysis versus transplant, it is um, three to four times now we're back on track. Here's what I just spoke about with the um, end-stage renal disease of really skilled nursing, the physicians, suppliers, that type of thing. And then the next slide tells you a little bit about hemodialysis. Now these are in, uh, in the thousands of what it's costing per year um, per person. Um, and then when you see transplant there, you see the significant decrease in that, and that's really those um, medications that they need to take for rejection and, and all of that. So in 2018, though, total Medicare-related expenditures for end-stage renal disease rose to $49.2 billion. So it's significant, um, and that is the highest um, waiting list that we have here in the United States. So as we go through a little bit further of that, um, history, Southeast Oregon Procurement Foundation was formed in 1968, and then in 1977, they uh, were the first one to have a computer-matched 
uh, system, which is how we allocate today through UNOS. In 1982, they, they established that 24-7 UNOS Center uh, with the assistance of then placing organs. So a center for the United States was helping place organs. And then the first effective drug treatment for rejection was in the 1980s. In 1984, National Organ Transplant Act, or NODA, was passed and established the framework really for the organ recovery and the allocation of those organs. There was some federal le legislation around that as well. So 1973, you had the extend the Medicare coverage to certain individuals with chronic renal disease, as well as in 1978, um, providing coverage under Medicare for end-stage renal disease to receive kidney transplantation services. So really bringing in the government into um, you know, part of the kidney transplant world. And this really just highlights the NODA and the um, health and human services and that branch of the government that is actually over allocation and all of those rules as well as all of the policies. And when you look at the UNOS headquarters, this is really where you see um, uh, all of the, um, the staff that works within UNOS headquarters are there for uh, national um, allocation of kidneys as well as answering any questions if you run into uh, significant um, issues or a policy that they want clarification on, that's what they're there for as well. So really what UNOS does is they increase and ensure effectiveness um, through their policies. They increase the supply of donated organs available for transplantation. Uh, they develop policy uh, monitoring and they enforce those processes. So if there's any type of violation, you would get a letter from UNOS um, asking you to explain why you did what you did. Um, an example of that would be if you had a late decline of a liver or something like that in the OR, you follow certain processes and at some point, you decide to give an open offer to an aggressive center, otherwise that organ would be discarded um, and not be able to be transplanted. So those are times where we take that um, and basically uh, the organ waste is just what we're trying to prevent. So they establish a system to collect, store, analyze, and publish that data as well, so they keep all of that data. So this is the OPTN policy, which is everything that we must abide by as an organ procurement organization and the biggest thing with that too is around, it's around 325 pages. And some of it is also very vague. Um, so really going through those policies um, with each organ as well as how we get referrals and how we deal with um, that as well as transplant centers and allocation is all in these 325 pages. So when you look at the donation service areas, this is all of the OPOs that you have across the country. And this, you know, part of the independent OPOs is now it's no longer in the hospitals. There are a few that are within a hospital, there, but they're not together within that hospital, not on the same system. Here in Indiana, we serve 88 of the 92 counties. So a little bit of Chicago serves the northern part and a little bit of um, Kentucky serves our, our lower part of the state as well. And then this is the actual regions for OPOs. So we are in region 10. Uh, so we work with Ohio, um, Michigan, um, and a lot of our colleagues um, work together on a lot of collaboratives in order to increase donation and, and a lot of sharing as well. So changes lead to milestones in donation. So um, there's been some breaking records by saving lives. Um, and I'm gonna go through a few of those with you. So in 2001, total living organ donors actually exceeded the number of deceased organ donors. So you're now able to have living donors for not only kidney, but liver as well. And then in 2014, actually in July of 2014, they added the definition of vascular allograft. And basically that is the transplantation of structures such as skin, bone, muscles, blood vessels, nerves, um, faces, extremities. Um, we've actually done two uterine transplants here in the state of Indiana. Um, so that's been something that's, that's been very, um, as we talk a lot about hope in families. Um, one particularly, uh, they had already had four children. Um, this was a head bleed type of situation. Uh, they were, um, the patient had become brain dead. And one of the things was that um, another um, individual patient um, needed a uterus in order to actually um, carry a child. 
and they decided that they had been able to give life and um, carry four children and they wanted to pass that on to be able to give that to someone else. So in 2017, the number of deceased donors topped over 10,000 in the United States, so a huge milestone. Another one, though, coming up in a pandemic. So in the pandemic, more than 33,000 lives were saved with transplants. So a huge record year in a year that we had to become very um, inventive and innovative of how we could continue to do donation. So in uh, 2021, uh, we topped 40,000 life-saving transplants in a single year. So if you go back just in 2001, where we're looking at, you know, 10,000, and now we're up to 40,000 with all the things that we're, we're trying to do to push forward and be able to save lives. So one of the things um, that we want to share with you is what have we done further um, in that innovation state? So really with Indiana Donor Network, when you look at the faces of challenges that we have, um, estimated in 2019, there's about 6.7 million people in the state of Indiana. And of those, 4.2 of those are registered donors. That means they made a legal decision to become an organ donor, which means if they're in a situation where they meet clinical triggers and they are having end-of-life care or brain death, we uphold that decision legally and proceed with organ donation. There's about 70,000 annual deaths in the state of Indiana. 24,000 of those actually happen within a hospital. Um, in those uh, organ referrals, we get about 13.39 thousand uh, referrals. Of all of those, only about 475 of those referrals are actually eligible for donation. And out of that, 278 became actual donors in 2021. So you do have some that are non-donor designated or not first person authorized. You have families that have had discussions and they um, actually declined donation and things like that. Um, we've also had um, some instability and, and different things that um, have caused donation to um, not move forward. So when you look at patients on the waiting list, like we talked about before, kidney is really the biggest waiting list that we have. So when we're looking through um, our referral process, and we'll talk about that in a couple of slides, um, you know, there's a lot of times where the heart and the lungs are already ruled out, and sometimes we get down to really liver and kidneys. And when you look at the list, that's where most of the people are waiting. And so even if we can get one kidney um, and be able to save someone's life and that person be able to give the gift that they wanted to give, um, that makes all the difference. So organs people are waiting for, 83% of the organs that are being waited for are kidneys, which goes back to the original, this is where donations started. And then the wait list by age. So as you get obviously 18 to 24, a little over 8,000, but it really jumps up 35 and higher. And um, that kind of coincides with what we're doing in Indiana Donor Network as well of increasing our age. Um, you know, and some of those ages are marginal donors, which means they can go into uh, recipients that are a little bit less sick, but then can regenerate and be able to take that marginal liver. Um, and then you tend to see uh, the more pristine livers and kidneys going into people that are um, a little bit more sick uh, that could you know, not have to regenerate and, and handle that. So what does that donation process look like? So basically how it all begins is we have the hospitals call in the referral. So they meet clinical triggers, which means they have a GCS less than five. Uh, they are vented. Um, and they can still have all reflexes at that point, but really there's just a few triggers to call into our Vitalink Donation Center. Our Vitalink Donation Center uh, answers that phone call and then they put that immediately out to a family advocate and a hospital services coordinator. At that point, uh, they call on the nurse, they go on site, they look in the EMRs and they get as much information as they possibly can. And then they call our administrator on call. Our administrator on calls are from the organ department and they are clinically trained. Uh, most of our organ department is uh, critical care nurses, critical care paramedics, respiratory therapists, um, as well as our surgical uh, recovery specialists, our CSTs and, and uh, uh, OR nurses. So once an AOC decides that we're gonna go ahead and start this case, then we'll, we'll send organ recovery coordinators on site and start that process. So for organ, uh, as you saw with that challenging upside down triangular. Um, if someone is vented, then they can be an organ donor. If they are not vented, which was about 50,000 plus deaths here in the state of Indiana, they can still be a tissue donor. 
um, and we can recover up to 24 hours. So if those are called in by a coroner, then our vital link donation center actually reaches out to a family and they're kind of on a clock at that point of the last known alive time to be able to um, uh, get authorization for, for tissue recovery. So who can be an organ donor? And really that, like I said, that evaluation is by our administrator on call. Our current um, age range for, India, for Indiana Donor Network is anyone between zero and 81. That's getting ready to go up to 85 with the new liver perfusion pumps that we are getting to Indiana Donor Network. So only specific rule out criteria. So greater than that age at this time, if you have active cancer uh, with METs, uh, doesn't have a heartbeat or not vented. And so types of organ donors, donation after brain death or donation after circulatory death. So brain death, uh, we actually read every uh, brain death declaration in the state of Indiana to make sure that they follow their own policy. That is something that is put on us by CMS to ensure that they are properly uh, declared uh, brain dead, as well as the timing and everything is, is appropriate. Um, as Dr. Osborne was talking about with a flat EEG and an overdose, we do not accept an EEG on an overdose. It has to be um, a CBF in those cases. Um, so they do follow their policy. We do have um, some policies from uh, Indiana Donor Network that we go above and beyond that just to ensure because this is donation, right? And if someone has a chance to, um, you know, to live, we want to be able to ensure that that is happening. So donation after circulatory death, what happens in that case um, is that the hospital still maintains the care of that patient by the attending physicians. However, they've made the decision to withdraw medical therapies and we have been called to approach the family. Um, if they decide on donation, then we are on site and requesting um, certain treatments to be given. Uh, we do a lot of, um, basically we're getting the organs ready to be able to be transplanted. And so we uh, do request of the physicians vent changes and, and uh, certain things, as well as OPT and require labs and diagnostics that must actually be done in order to be able to allocate the organs. Uh, however, we are there to, to facilitate that organ process, which means they don't actually become our patient until they expire in the OR. And once they do that, we'll talk a little bit later of, of how we um, ECMO is coming into that piece. So heart, lungs, liver, kidney, pancreas, and intestine are some of the uh, um, organs that can be transplanted. You can also split the livers um, as well. So when you think about um, how many organs can actually be transplanted or lives saved, uh, really up to nine um, at this point. And then VCA, like we talked about before, face, extremities. We have done an extremity before as well. Abdominal walls, uterine, larynx, uh, nerve, and some others. So what rules in for referral donation? Really organ function. So a lot about what uh, Dr. Osborne said as well is we've done quite a few um, referrals that have come in for, um, that have been on ECMO and have gotten to that point where it's become a futile effort. They're still on ECMO um, and they've called them in clinical triggers. A lot of times we've been following them for a little while um, and really looking at that organ function. As you all know, um, for us, getting an initial referral in, especially after cardiac arrest, we don't expect the labs and all of that to be um, pristine at that time. Uh, so we a lot of times keep those referral op referrals open for days, sometimes weeks, to see if kidney function, liver function is turning around. So really trying to push those boundaries and ruling in for donations. So really some unconventional donors uh, that we've had, some older donors. Um, our oldest donor that we have had at Indiana Donor Network is 75 years old for organ donation, 103 for tissue. Um, but with the new um, technology with ex vivo type of liver pumps, uh, we're looking to um, increase that age to 85. Um, and the research trials that have been done recently uh, with those liver pumps, um, they have um, done several uh, liver uh, transplants in the, in the high 80s some marginal donors that maybe had been ruled out in the past. So really our motto is to um, go to the OR and being able to um, recover organs, especially kidneys, put them on a kidney pump and make the transplant centers tell us no. Um, that's how we know if something is, can be transplantable or not. Um, we have been able to transplant um, creatinines of greater than eight 
um, because the kidneys were able to open up beyond um, our kidney pumps. We put our kidney pumps on in the OR of DCDs and brain death, and we were able to give um, a lot more information from the beginning to those renal transplant physicians. And then patients on ECMO. You know, this is something in the past where, oh, they're on ECMO, yeah, go, you can go ahead and close it. Um, and that is not something that we are doing anymore. We've been doing this now for about a year and a half. Um, we've had quite a lot on ECMO, and I think, like Dr. Osborne said, there's, ECMO's a little bit different than what it was years ago. It used to be kind of more of like that last ditch effort, and people are being put on ECMO a little bit sooner now, a lot younger patients as well. So we've um, had ECMO patients from 20 uh, to 51 is our oldest ECMO patient that they've all been able to transplant, have organs um, transplanted to recipients. So that is a newer um, range for us. I will say that looking at some of the research um, and what percentages are being able to be increased by, you know, ECMO has now then become a futile effort. They've decided to withdraw, but it's provided a bridge to donation as well. And when you look through some of that research, Abdominal organs transplants with normal or near normal uh, graft function in the recipient, especially kidneys, as well as ECMO donors are uh, estimated to have increased donation thus far by 40%. So you'll see a, an increase across the country with donation after circulatory death and a lot of increased um, use of uh, patients that have been on ECMO and they've left the ECMO on. The other, the other thing about this is that when we are evaluating for donation after circulatory death, we are deciding how quickly do we think that they will pass? And that makes a difference of the organs that are in, which means we will go up to 90 minutes, some will go up to 120 minutes. In the state of Indiana, we go to 90. And usually after about 20, 25 minutes, um, the heart is out and the liver is out. Um, that being said, um, we have to think about, okay, how quickly will this person pass? So you have somebody who is near brain death, but They've had a crany, so they've not officially you know, become brain dead. Those people will pass pretty quickly. A GCS of three not on sedation, going to pass pretty quickly. Somebody who's on you know, Levo and Epi, you turn those off, they're going to pass pretty quickly. Same thing when we have you know, balloon pumps on a you know, one-to-one -one or, or ECMO. When all those things are stopped, they're going to pass pretty quickly, which means you do have um, a little bit more viable organs as well. So I don't know if this is going to play. This is a short little video just to kind of get inside of where we are with donation and what our organ recovery coordinator teams do. Um, are you able to push that? Are you able to, okay. I don't know if you have sound. So I've been a uh, critical care nurse for 25 years. Uh, I grew up at Wishard here in uh, Indianapolis for 15 years in the emergency department. I also worked in the ICU and I was also one of the house supervisors over Wishard for four years. I was also a flight nurse for 15 years. Um, so in doing all those things and being around a lot of critical care patients, um, when I first came to Indiana Donor Network about five and a half years ago, I didn't really know what organ recovery coordinators did. And um, you know, part of this video is really showing um, the autonomy and they're really directing the care of, of these patients. Um, the organ recovery coordinators are critical care nurses uh, for the most part um, of all of them. They're coming from the ICUs, the CV ICUs, we're good, okay. Every donor patient is different because you want to be able to transplant um, the most organs as possible from that patient for the recipients, but mainly because that was the donor's um, choice. Ideally, you want to transplant the most organs, but it doesn't always happen like that. So we assess each organ system when we come on site. I can try before he gets here, and if I can't, then that would be something. We take over um, okay. the care of the patient from the hospital, and we will manage them and make sure that organ systems are working properly um, and that everything is where we want it to be. We will draw blood. We will get our infectious disease results, our blood type back, 
We work 24-hour shifts, so we're on call from 8 a.m. to 8 a.m. the next morning, which means we are at a hospital from 8 a.m. to the following 8 a.m. the next morning if we have a case going on at the time. Our cases usually take anywhere between 24 to 48, possibly 72 hours. So we are passing off to the next person that comes on shift in the morning at 8 a.m. They're taking over for us from the point that we are at at that time. Left kidney out, 0136. Yeah, no dialysis there. We facilitate the donation process of taking the donor, getting their organs back into prime functioning. Five millimeters. And then finding those recipients of the donor's gifts. All right. Infarct no. Once the recovery begins, it's a lot of phone calls to transplant centers who want to know what visualization of the organ looks like. They want to know um, about how far away they can anticipate the organ arriving to their transplant center. They may decide that the organ is not a good match for their recipient, and so we will continue to try to locate a recipient as long as we possibly can. I was calling you regarding a uh, primary pancreas that we sent for research. Um, AM. We are all so invested in what we are doing, and, you know, sometimes I'm at home and I'm wondering about how the donor's doing on the case that I was on yesterday, or um, I'm calling co-workers to see, hey, you know, are these organs still functioning well? Were we able to turn them around? How many Recipients have we found. We're also going to do a moment of silence. Remember, this room becomes sacred when a family entrusts us with one of their most precious possessions. The moment of silence that we do prior to recovery, it's a really unique thing that we do here. And what I feel like this gives to the family is it gives them the sense that they're sharing their loved one with the people who are going to be there in their last moments. It helps remind us and reground us on the magnitude of what we're there to do. You take a tragedy and a terrible situation, and what comes out of it is healing for families and healing for the people that knew that patient that passed, uh, but also saving lives on the other end and really creating a new life for those people being able to start a new life. And that is something that is what we always have in our minds and that's what keeps it fulfilling for me and it's it's a great experience so that just gives you a little bit of uh, a snippet um, of what our teams uh, do during that organ donation process so they really are optimizing that organ function. They're doing their testing that is required by OPTN. There's charting documentation. They're then allocating those organs, scheduling the OR and, and coordinating logistics um, of teams either flying in or getting local recovery, uh, that organ recovery and documentation, and then packaging and labeling for OPTN policy. So how can we ex uh, further expand uh, those gifts? So one of the things that we have done is in-house recovery. So traditionally, organ procurement organizations have taken place in the donor hospital, which is what you saw there. That was actually um, at Hendricks Hospital um, here just uh, west of the city. Um, however, approximately 20% of all organ procurement organizations have initiated an OPO in-house based model, which there's about four of us actually across the country that have in-house. So what we decided to do um, was do that same thing, and here are some of the reasons for that. Really to save more lives because it um, typically recovery happens faster in an in-house facility. You're not competing on scheduled surgeries. You're not completing with a, you know, trauma is coming in and that type of thing. Uh, improved process for hospitals. So especially in the COVID pandemic, we were able to move patients out of the hospitals to free up ICU beds and bring them to our facility better uh, donor family experiences and the families are able to visit our center as well, as well as reduce costs um, as an effective way to minimize those organ recovery costs, not only the healthcare system, but also um, competitively for insurance companies and, and that as well. And faster, less travel time being in a central location. 
So our organ recovery team, like we talked about, is a critical care nurses, respiratory therapists, and critical care paramedics. Some of that hands-on donor management, even though they were managing donors in the hospital, and they're now doing that hands-on. So ventilator training of actually touching that ventilator, monitors, EKGs, portable x-rays, bronchoscopy, echoes, CT, and uh, we have a cardiac cath lab in our facility as well. Our surgical recovery specialists are CSTs and uh, OR nurses, and this is actually our OR here um, at Indiana Donor Network. We have two of those. And that was, this is one of our ORs we did when we first started. We started on April 13th to build our in-house recovery during the beginning of the pandemic. We did a mock trial on May 15th, and we went live on May 18th. So about 32 days into that, building our in-house recovery. Um, and that article released in IBJ really talking about those crucial steps of donation. And don't, we actually successfully uh, transported and recovered our first uh, donor on the 21st, so just three days after going live. So is that working? So what we're seeing is that in these brain dead cases that we're bringing into in-house, that there is an increase in the organs transplanted, which is the orange line, which is what we wanna see. Um, there is a um, organs transplanted per donor is also higher than in hospital, as well as our discard rate of any of our organs is actually lower than what it is in the hospital. So what we're doing is working, but I guess the biggest thing is what about DCD? What about after circulatory death, which is what we're not able to bring in, into our in-house facility? So that's actually, because of the rise in DCD, there's this renewal of what can we do heart transplantation-wise with a uh, donor after circulatory death. Um, the DCD uh, paradigm has really the potential to increase overall heart transplantation volume by 20%. And so what we're seeing in our state is really uh, some of the surgical techniques that are um, making that happen. So if you're doing a DCD heart, um, and usually these are the, the younger ages uh, that you're seeing, and you also expect them to pass pretty quickly. So normothermic regional perfusion, which is what we're gonna talk about a little bit later, which is NRP, uh, direct procurement and perfusion, and then per, uh, procurement for a co-located donor. Um, so what we see with those is it's, the co-located donors don't happen obviously as often. Uh, we haven't done any of those in the state. We have done NRP quite a bit. Um, and then also um, having the use of ex vivo machines within the DCD realm as well. So going through each one of those. So donor blood is first collected to prime an ex vivo machine. And that's about four packed red blood cells prior to uh, the OR. The heart is then retrieved uh, from the donor and connected to an ex vivo perfusion or like you've seen a heart in the box. Um, and they're reperfused and reanimated at that time. After return of the cardiac rhythm, the heart is then evaluated for transplant um, and continued um, levels that they are pulling labs and then we'll go ahead and take that and those, these are also transportable so they're taking that back to their transplant center. The next one is preservation of arrested heart is initially using topical cold infusion uh, into the donor. The heart is recovered and then expeditiously transplanted to an adjacent operating room. Uh, this is something that would be a very special moment. I guess we could go back to that Chicago Med thing. I guess maybe the person on the third floor could get that heart in some of those situations. Um, that would be something that would definitely be a UNOS violation, but uh, maybe worth being able to, um, to get that done expeditiously. Um, here in the state of Indiana, we do have several programs that have come in uh, to our state who have done this quite frequently. Um, Two of those programs are Vanderbilt. Um, I know that when they came into uh, Indiana just a couple of months ago, they were already on their 100th time of doing NRP with transplant, and then Wisconsin as well. And some of the steps we're gonna share with you later is uh, from some examples from some of their programs. So the last one is the normal thermic regional perfusion. So the patient has a cardiac time of death. Uh, the cerebral circulation is interrupted, and this has been part of the ethical piece than what's been talked about before. The reason why they do this is basically to eliminate the theoretical recovery of the brain activity after resuscitation. So that is done um, immediately. Um, and then subsequently, regional cardiopulmonary uh, bypass or, or ECMO is instituted to reperfuse and reanimate the heart inside the donor. So after return of the perfusing cardiac rhythm, the heart is evaluated for transplantation. Sometimes most protocols are at least giving 30 minutes to that and will go up to at least an hour and a half 
So looking at those clinical trials and in that research of um, obviously um, in Europe first and then coming over here to the United States, um, like I had mentioned before, Vanderbilt and uh, Wisconsin were part of those trials prior to. To just go through this, um, and then I'll hand it over to Jeff to kind of go through those steps, but when you look at the top um, part of this uh, diagram, it really talks about brain death and then that heart evaluation. You know, in DCD hearts, you're still having to evaluate that heart in the beginning. Is it is it a good heart where it sits now? It's not that they're coming in and then trying to, um, you know, reperfuse and reanimate that heart to be something that it wasn't already before. So brain death, uh, you have that heart evaluation, you have acceptance, and then you get to procurement, and then you have this cold static storage, which is the blue piece, and then transplant. Uh, when you get into the second, which is B, you have that withdrawal of, of uh, life-sustaining therapy, and this is that, that cold pre preservation or getting that um, on like a heart in the box. So you have this hypoxic time uh, with a cardiac arrest. The patient is pronounced. Um, there is a five minute waiting period where we, everyone, in a DCD, all of the transplant surgeons are in a separate OR. We have someone, a representative to do documentation of vital signs uh, once extubation has happened and life sustaining measures have been taken off. Once that uh, patient has actually had a cardiac time of death, the surgeons all come into the room and they are ready to start. Uh, we have a five minute handoff period. So basically our organ coordinators are counting down the seconds until they can actually make incision. Um, so in that time when you see this, you've got all of that time in the blue where you've got um, you know, cell degradation, uh, decrease in organ function, you know, those types of things. And then C is really that withdrawal, but actually using ECMO. So as you can see here with the um, withdrawal of life-sustaining uh, therapy, then you've got your cardiopulmonary arrest, you've got where you now uh, have circulatory death, you've got your um, five minute wait period, now you've got resuscitation and procurement starts, meaning that they're now putting on an ECMO and now they're reperfusing not only the heart, but they're also now reperfusing every organ. And we'll talk about that in a couple of slides too, but I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff to go through some of these steps. How are we doing on time? Okay. So I appreciate you having us here. Um, much like Colonel Osborne, Dr. Osborne, I was trained in military uh, medicine, so um, we kind of think outside the box a little bit differently. Uh, some of the example steps that we do with NRP and with any perfusion that we do for our organs, we're looking at prolonging the cell uh, to be able to be transplanted. So prior to the DCD organ acceptance, we do all of our testing and looking at making sure that this heart or these lungs, uh, liver function, kind of like Sherry talked about, is you know satisfactory to be transplanted. Um, we also confirm uh, what kind of resources that we have. Uh, when we're doing DCD organ donation, we're in hospitals, whether they're large trauma centers, small centers, uh, regional hospitals, uh, the smallest hospital that you see, <laughs> that's when we do the DCDs. Um, we're looking for making sure that we're working with the transplant centers from two of the major ones that we've been working with with NRP are uh, Vanderbilt and also Wisconsin. However, there's about eight to 10 of them throughout the nation that have been doing this. I would really like to see this done on just about every DCD we, we evaluate. Uh, this is just one, we, we kind of took the way that Wisconsin does stuff to understand where we were going with our DCD. Uh, I had the opportunity to train some ECMO uh, at University of Michigan and also Spectrum Health in Grand Rapids. Uh, I'm originally from Michigan, however, now I'm a Hoosier, so trying to figure that out. Um, I still say go blue. Uh, so what we do is we evaluate the donor. We, we look at uh, the opportunity. We want to withdraw the support in the OR at, at all costs, especially with NRP, because we want to set up our circuit. We want to make sure that we heparinize the patient in the OR. Um, in that five minute standoff period, we are ready to, we're scrubbed in, we're uh, ready to go. Um, currently, we are in Europe, in Italy, uh, we sent, when I was working at Gift of Life Michigan, we sent one of our coworkers over to learn how to do some uh, perfusion and tried to do some ECMO. Uh, liver and abdominal recovery by cannulating through the groin prior to the withdrawal. 
Uh, we have switched that over a little bit. We are now doing some VA ECMO. We're doing in situ cannulation, so uh, going right, right directly in and after the patient has expired. So um, we'll kind of walk through the process. Um, we're looking at, they can go up to an hour, hour 15, depending on when we have our agonal phase. Each uh, program out there that's currently doing NRP has a little bit different agonal phase, so we want to monitor the vital signs every minute. Um, Wisconsin is, as uh, soon as we hit the agonal phase, uh, in other words, when the patient's getting ready to pass, life support's been withdrawn, we're going through and the heart starts to decrease, you know, our pressures go down and our oxygenation goes down. They have about 30 minutes, 20 minutes, give or take, on what we're gonna do. A lot of it depends on the age of the patient. Currently, you know, anywhere from age 16, they would go down to age 10, depending if they have a recipient for that size heart, uh, all the way up to about age 55. And we're going through, and we've already done an echo prior to this, so we know the function of the heart. Um, but we're going in, we, after we hit that agonal phase and the patient starts to pass, once they pass, we look at the time, we're in, scrubbed in, ready to cannulate. Uh, we have that five minute window. As soon as that five minute window goes, we're cannulated on VA ECMO within about a minute and a half. So um, it's extremely fast. We have uh, usually two surgeons that are working on it. Uh, and then we have a perfusionist, uh, the equipment that we use, the ECMO circuit, uh, cannulation kit, ISTAT, because we're gonna draw labs off after we put this patient on ECMO. Because during the death process, obviously, you know the lactate's gonna go up. Um, we want to make sure that electrolyte balance is, is good. We may be on the ECMO for anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes just to uh, kind of fix the electrolyte and balance, make sure our lactate's good. Um, we continuously monitor that. Not only is ECMO good for the heart, but we're also evaluating the lungs during this time. We can, we can do a bronchoscopy because during that time that they uh, expired, you know, there's no tube. There's nothing to protect from secretions going down in the lungs. So we will actually reintubate. Um, the carotids are tied off, so we're not uh, reperfusing the brain. Um, we'll reintubate, we'll do our PO2s, we'll do challenge gases, we will do recruitment of the lungs. Um, as I said, we have two thoracic surgeons this is just for the ECMO and also the heart. This doesn't include the lung team, the abdominal team. We usually have roughly about six surgeons uh, all in this space during this time. And the other thing is if we can't get them on that ECMO within a short period of time, then we go ahead and we'll recover the, the abdominal organs. We'll, we'll go forward with just regular type uh, process of recovering DCD abdominal organs. Um, I already talked a little bit about this. Uh, prior to the extubation, though, I wanted to let you guys know that we also give 30,000 units of heparin so we can anticoagulate them. Um, and so there's not microclots that are forming during the death process. Uh, we get the circuit going and we draw the blood off. Um, as we go back through where we were, uh, we get them on the ECMO. We're doing the uh, cannulation. We do the bronchoscopies, uh, the liver surgeon, the kidney surgeon, the pancreas surgeon, they're, they're looking at vasculature, um, just really moving through. The great thing about doing this is, as Sherry pointed out on that slide earlier, where the uh, death of the cells are happening, it's not happening on this. We are able to reperfuse these organs. We're able to do it warm. Um, we're able to evaluate. So everything that a patient goes through during that death process with electrolyte and balance, lactate, everything is, we're able to reverse it. So it's making these organs much more viable in the long run with uh, whether it's kidneys, heart, lungs, it doesn't matter. They are doing much better. We really want to see that to can, and, and as I'm flipping through here, these are just the steps that we go through. Um, it's really uh, a step-by-step -step thing that the surgeons are doing to cannulate and go on the circuit. Um, just going through. And the, the timing of this is everything because we're able to get uh, cannulation, we're able to use the ISTAT to look at all the labs, correct anything. Um, we're able to either do it uh, through IV or direct to be able to make the changes uh, or central line, obviously. And this is really laid down step by step of what we're doing, where we're cannulating. And we're still learning this. Um, 
we're looking at doing this at Indiana with our, a couple of our transplant programs here to where we're gonna do this on hopefully every DCD in the future. It, it is definitely something that has come about in the last two years. I had the opportunity to work in Hawaii for a little bit um, and talking about a little bit of the perfusion side of it is we had Duke come over uh, in the Hawaiian Islands, there's one transplant center, Queens, they do abdominals. As you can imagine that the logistics is very hard to get uh, any of the thoracic organs off the island because you got a six hour flight no matter what. And typically we want these organs back in uh, a patient within six hours. So we, we flew Duke out on a, <laughs> on a commercial um, and then I'll hand this back over. We flew Duke out on a uh, commercial flight with the surgeon. Uh, we used a transmedic device. Uh, we did our recovery and we had to fly the transmedic device with the lungs on it, first class with the surgeon, all the way back over to the mainland uh, to California. And then they put him on a private jet all the way back over to Duke. Uh, this was a very young donor. Uh, 17 was the age and we were able to transplant those lungs first time in about eight years out of Hawaii. So that was one of the things with the newer devices, the perfusion devices, it really helps out. So just a couple more slides. So really expanding those gifts further, like Jeff alluded to, this is not something to be clear, this is not something that we are doing at Indiana Donor Network yet. Um, this is uh, what is happening in our ORs, but Vanderbilt, uh, Wisconsin are actually bringing in all of their, all of the supplies and equipment that you see in their staff. But it is something that we are looking into as far as being able to provide this ourselves. And one of the reasons for that is because after the first time that especially our local surgeons were a part of an NRP, uh, I got several phone calls afterwards and said, I want to do this on every one because this now turns this donor into a, essentially a, a brain dead donor. Um, and when you look at the recovery process for donation after circulatory death versus donation after brain death, after circulatory death, it's fast. And there's sometimes there are surgical injuries, sometimes there are surgical injuries where it makes organs non-transplantable. So at this point, um, that's why we are looking and moving forward with um, looking into that to provide that by IDN. So liver procurement and NRP, that's something that across the country um, and some of the DCD collaboratives that we're having, um, that is a huge interest because we also have a huge increase in our DCD donors. Um, and really increasing when you looked at the surgeon, um, when we talked about those wait times before, so really if someone doesn't pass in that 20, 25 minutes, the liver is out. However, with NRP, they'll go up to 45 minutes and then be able to still keep that liver in, which means when we looked back really um, over the last um, year, uh, two, year of 2020 and 2021, that actually would have had potential for an increase of 21 livers that could have been transplanted if NRP were used. So it's a huge increase in being able to increase donation as well. So as we talked about, strategies for the future, abdominal NRP um, on DCD, transplant center buy-in from that, and an ECMO specialist and team to perform the NRP at the hospital um, or potentially OPO. So really why is ECMO important for donation? So initially used in patients where other options have been you know, exhausted and when the outcomes of ECMO are futile, there is still hope and there's still hope for that family. Dr. Osborne talked about what the hope of the family and the time that they were able to spend, this actually gives them even further hope of being able to save lives when everything else has been done. Bridging to preserve that option for donation, and then, like I talked about before, gives hope to families and, and really upholds a uh, the patient's legal decision to become an organ donor as well. That's all I have.